Hello, welcome to your first online psychology lesson of 2021. I'm so sad I don't get to see you all face to face, but hopefully you've all had a really nice Christmas and you've managed to relax and you're ready for this new term, even though it is remotely, unfortunately. So by now you all know the drill. We're gonna, but well, I'm gonna talk you through the PowerPoint and you just make notes, answer the questions. Once a week, we're going to have a live lesson. I might increase them, depending on how the first one goes. Um, but yeah, so we've got that to look forward to. I want to address the fact that some of you might be feeling a little bit unmotivated to do work. Obviously, I'm still waiting for further guidance from Department for Education and the school about what's going on with exams and things. But all I do know is that currently I do not have enough evidence for you guys to get your predicted grades. So it's really important that we keep working, we keep working through the content, because I assume that at some point, whether, even though it won't be like your official exams, I do assume that we'll have some sort of mock, um, maybe once we're back at school. So there's still, there's still a need to work and to be revising and learning the content hopefully that motivates you enough if it doesn't then i might just promise you all a stars if you do all of the remote learning um but yes so back to issues and debates um last lesson that we did before christmas was free will and determinism so we are on to nature versus nurture and your starter for today is to one, name one psychological approach which supports the idea of psychodeterminism. Two, name one psychological approach which supports the idea of environmental determinism. And three, explain why biological determinism is an example of soft determinism. Feel free to look back at your notes. If you're not quite sure, look at your textbook. So please pause me now and answer the questions. So I should mention that... I want you to upload your uh, notes onto Teams, please, after this lesson, just so I know that you're all keeping up. So, number one, name one psychological approach which supports the idea of psychic determinism. That's obviously psychodynamic. It says that our behaviour is determined by our libido, our sexual drive, and that that is what will determine our later personalities, um, whether we can become fixated at a certain part certain stage of our psychosexual development will make changes in our personalities. Name one psychological approach which supports the idea of environmental determinism, that's obviously behaviourism. Um, so the idea of classical conditioning and operant conditioning, and that is how we um, learn behaviour. And then explain why biological determinism is an example of soft determinism. Um, you could have said research such as um, research done into monozygotic twins and concordance rates never gives an 100% concordance rate, which means that the environment must play a, a role somehow. Um, therefore, yes, biology does determine our behaviour, but there is an element of free will attached to that. So lesson objectives for today, we're going to explore the influence of nature and that's genetic and evolutionary explanations. And then we're going to also look at nurture, which is behaviorism, social learning theory, which we've absolutely done to death, and then other explanations. Okay, so the nature nurture debate. Firstly, I want to ask you a question. What is an interactionist approach? I want you to pause me if you need some time to think about it. An interactionist approach, we've looked at, looked at it in various topics, um, and it's having this genetic vulnerability to have a specific type of behaviour, but needing the environment to work in a way that means that genetic vulnerability is seen in your behaviour, basically. So you might have a genetic vulnerability for schizophrenia, but you need maybe like a traumatic experience, or you need a life stress, um, in order for that schizophrenia to be seen. So an interactionist approach provides us with a better understanding of behaviour because it's very unlikely that nature and nurture 
are independent of each other, they're interdependent, they work together. So, for example, hardwired systems are passed on through heredity. So, the structure of your hippocampus will affect your memory ability. You might have an excellent structure of your hippocampus, but if you do not use your hippocampus, if you don't um, use maintenance rehearsal in order to revise for your A-levels, for example, um, then your hippocampus is not going to be very useful. Um, so we need this flexible system that responds to the environment and that ensures the individual makes maximum use of their innate qualities. So from the topics that we have studied, I want you to try and think of as many examples as you can of nature, nurture and interactionism and explain why they are examples of each. So it can be any topics um, or approaches as well. We're going to look at these a little bit later on. We're going to look at research into all of them. So firstly, how would you define nature and nurture? And I know that most of you know this um, because in the comparison essay for your PPE, your the comparison essay where you had to compare humanism and psychodynamic, you wrote about nature and nurture and you did it very effectively. Um, but just as a little recap, Nature is anything that's innate, so it's our biology, it's our genes. Um, so for this, this you you would argue that the psychodynamic perspective or approach is nature, because it looks at our innate drives, our libido, our sexual energy, and that is what causes our personalities. Um, some of you as well wrote about how the id, ego, and super ego are innate, like they're not derived from the environment um it's also any ability that's determined by genes it's also secondary sexual characteristics so characteristics that are developed during puberty so it's not just necessarily things that you're born with for example hunting sensitivities only appears in adulthood but that is still due to nature um nurture um is acquired through any sorry anything that's acquired through interactions with the environment both the physical and the social world is best to refer to as experience and it's sometimes even before birth so having a mother who smokes will have an effect on the fetus um, and even though you haven't been born yet that um, is still nurture because it's part of your environment rather than your nature so examples of influence of nature we have the genetic and the evolutionary explanation so firstly the genetic explanation you already know we're going to talk about twins um, family studies and adoption studies, they all show that the closer two individuals are genetically, the more likely that both of them will develop the same behaviours. And of course, you all know, this is talking about concordance rates. And an example of this is in schizophrenia. So for monozygotic twins who share 100% of their DNA, the concordance rate is 40%. And for dizygotic twins which share who share the same genetic material as siblings 50% the concordance rate is 7% this close similarity for individuals with the same genes shows that nature has a major contribution to the disorder because the more genetically related you are in terms of monozygotic twins the more likely they are to have the same mental disorder and then we look at evolutionary explanation and any evolutionary explanation that we'll ever looked at is based on the principle that behaviour promotes survival and reproduction. So we've looked at this recently when we looked at aggression and how that could be seen as an adaptive behaviour. This is because such behaviours are adaptive and therefore the behaviour will be passed on to subsequent generations. Can you think of an example of an adaptive behaviour? I might have just given you a clue. Um, but there's lots of other adaptive behaviours that you might be able to think of. So attachment is a an adaptive um, behaviour that's innate because an infant is more likely to be protected and therefore more likely to survive. So um, close relationships are also formed so they can foster successful reproduction because as you all know the um, the the likelihood to basically when you have close attachment types in childhood then you're more likely to have stronger and better relationships when you're older and 
that will lead to um, more chance of reproduction, I guess. Therefore, attachment behaviours are naturally selected, which can only be done through genetics. So that's nature, evolutionary explanations and genetic explanations. And then in terms of examples of the influence of nurture, we're going to look at behaviourism, social learning theory and other explanations. But firstly, we're going to look at behaviourism. Um, behaviourists assume that we are all blank slates when we're born and it's only our environment and our experiences that shape who we are. So how could attachment be explained using behaviourist principles such as classical and operant conditioning? I want you to pause me now and think about that. Okay, so firstly, classical conditioning. Remember, the bit in the middle of classical conditioning is as as in association. So classical conditioning is all about associating um, stimulus response to things with each other. So with attachment, you could have um, said how the milk the baby drinks is the unconditioned stimulus and it creates an unconditioned response, which is pleasure. The neutral stimulus is the mother, um, but when she is constantly paired with the unconditioned stimulus, the milk, then even when the unconditioned stimulus isn't there, the baby will receive pleasure um, because the mother has become the conditioned stimulus and the conditioned response has become, well, is pleasure. Um, and then in terms of operant conditioning, food reduces hunger, so that's negative reinforcement because it's taken away something bad. Or you could have said it's positive reinforcement as well, the baby enjoys the taste of the food. And then we look at social learning theory. So what is social learning theory? I want you to pause me, think about it, maybe write a little sentence. Learning is acquired through learning but also through vicarious reinforcement. So social learning theory believes in the principles of behaviourism, but Bandura um, and so other social learning theorists believe that there was a little bit more, there's a little bit more um, in terms of the cognitive approach that goes into learning, such as the mediational processes, attention, retention, reproduction, motivation. And... Also, this um, this term of vicarious reinforcement, so learning through other people. They also believed, um, unlike behaviorism, that biology does have a small play, a small role to play. So, for example, the um, the urge to play aggressively might be biological. It might be due to your hormones or your um, neurotransmitters. But the important point was how someone expresses their anger and the only way we know how to express our anger is through how we have learnt so how we've learnt through the media or through our parents or our siblings and then we have other explanations of nurture um how does double bind theory explain schizophrenia so if you think back it was when i forced you all to do those silly role plays um, which some of you got very invested in, to be fair. I, I highly enjoyed them. Um, but if you think back, what were those what were those role plays about? And how did they explain schizophrenia? It was Bateson who suggested that schizophrenia develops um, in children who receive contradictory messages from their parents. So, for example, a mother saying, I love you, whilst turning away in disgust. Um... Or I remember Doug and Jack's role play of when the father made a big deal out of planning the birthday party and then didn't come up, didn't show up, sorry. Um, so it's these um, conflicting messages um, that parents give and they prevent the child from developing an accurate construction of reality, which may lead to the symptoms of schizophrenia. Okay, so... That is it for nature and nurture. Your last task is to have a look at these and you don't have to write them down. Um, Just have a look and maybe write one, how many are there? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. So just write one to 12 and then write either nature or nurture. And what I'll do, because your next lesson 
is a live lesson. Um, so we'll go through this as a starter at the beginning of our live lesson, which I hope you're very excited for, because I am. Um, if you have any questions, please email me or post it on Teams. If not, please post your notes onto Teams. Okay, and I will see you soon. Bye.